Well, good morning and welcome to the First Free Methodist Church this morning. Today is July the 10th as summer's, summer's been a beautiful week and it's flying right by us. I'd like to welcome you today. We're in a special summer series called Par Prophet Margins and we're looking at the prophets today. We're looking at the prophet Amos. And it is a opportunity for us to look at our lives, examine our hearts, and ask ourselves this question, are my eyes looking at what they should be and seeing the correct thing? And is my heart right before the Lord? And Pastor Barry's going to be sharing that with us this morning. So before we get started, please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you that you are a God who knows all and sees all, and you see often what we don't see. We can't see it because we don't have the perspective that you do. So Lord, I pray that today you would open our eyes, open our hearts so that we would truly receive your message that you have for us today. Pray an anointing on Pastor Barry as he shares your word with us. And I ask God that we would leave today with our eyes open to ways that we can serve you. And I ask this all in your name, amen.
Good morning. This morning I'll be reading from Psalm 82, and I'm using the New International Version. God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere men. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me oh, his love for me. His love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me, all his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. My sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen. Not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. The sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Child of God, yes, I am. In this series, we will learn the life lesson of the importance of having a relationship with God and discover how God sees a prophet in each of us. We will be introduced to several prophets from the Old Testament. A prophet is someone who hears messages from God and tells those messages to others. We are going to be looking at ways to communicate used over time for people to share their messages. During each week of the series, a new way will be shown. Today's communication method is a video call. There are lots of ways to make a video call, such as Zoom, Microsoft Teams, or FaceTime. Have you ever been on a video call? This new way to share a message allows us to see and talk with many people at the same time. One awesome thing about Zoom is that we can talk with others from anywhere in the whole world. 
Sometimes there are many people on a video call and no one lives near anyone else. This gives us a great opportunity to spread a message to many places at one time. Amos probably wished he could have used a video call when he needed to spread God's message outside of Israel. With God, you can spread God's message of truth and love to the entire world. Spreading God's message was true for Amos and it is true for you. Hey kids, you can head on downstairs to grow. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you own. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. We pour out our praise to you only.
Would you please join with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, you are so good, and you are so great and loving and compassionate. Merciful and gracious, Lord, you are worthy of all worship and praise and honor. And we glorify you, Lord, and we seek to glorify you in all of our thoughts, words, and deeds. Despite our many failures, Lord, we want hearts that are hearts that seek after you in all things. And we confess, Lord, that despite our hearts, us earnestly wanting to glorify and to seek you, our hearts lead us astray. All of our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, those things done and left undone that take us away from you and your glory and your mission for us here on earth as it is in heaven. And I just pray, Lord, that we come before you now, confessing our sins, confessing our failures. We lay them down at your feet, asking for your forgiveness and seeking a heart of repentance. And Lord, you are faithful and just, and we are so thankful that those of you, those of us who ask for your forgiveness in your faithfulness, you give forgiveness. And we just, in that spirit of thankfulness, Lord, we come before you thanking you for our friends, our family, the beautiful weather, the freedoms that we have in this country. And I just ask that we never take those for granted. We don't take our friends for granted, our families for granted. The country that we are born into, we don't take that for granted, Lord. And Lord, now we pray and ask for your healing hand to come upon those who are hurting mentally, physically, emotionally, and perhaps worst of all, spiritually, Lord, those who hurt. We just ask for your healing hand, your hand of peace to come, out, to come over them and to touch their hearts and to bring them back to wholeness with you. We pray for Andy and his family, Lord. We pray for your peace and your love to wash over them and to know you, Lord, in this time of grief and sorrow. And finally, Lord, I pray for all of us as we are preparing our hearts to hear this message that is being prepared for us. Soften our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to what you would have us learn, what you would have us know about you, Lord, and how we can be stewards of the name, of your name, and carry it with honor and glory and show others what it means to be a follower of you, showing love and compassion to the hurt and the marginalized. We love you, Lord, and in your name we pray. Amen. I have a friend of mine who is a real Renaissance man. He's a teacher. Uh, he had started in architecture in doing the draftings and drawings, <clears throat> which means he's a visual artist. He's a singer and a musician and a photographer. And how often as I've seen him uh, have his camera on his journeys whenever he goes, and then he'll stop and he takes pictures of, you know, maybe something that most of us would miss. It could be something as simple as, you know, an old rusted uh, tin sign uh, next to, you know, old wooden beam and then a pile of uh, f um, firewood. And that, you know, composition just shows the different hues and tones of that particular color. In this case, it was brown. Then some other times he'll pick some kind of lovely mural that he shows. And on the mural there'll be some kind of words and maybe a sign. And sometimes there's irony and humor and other times there's difficult things to see. And when I see his pictures, you know, it often goes along the lines of, oh, look at that. You know, I've never, never seen that before. That's interesting. 
Maybe you have a friend uh, who's like that. They just have this way of seeing things that is maybe different than others. They see something particular. This morning we are continuing our summer sermon series looking at the messages that God gave the prophets to help his people better love and serve him. <clears throat> and I want to speak this morning before I get into the message about the place of prophets in uh, what God does because I think there's in the church a bit of confusion when we think of prophets and prophecy. And as we heard last week, uh, a prophet is someone who is called by God to deliver his message to the people. That's the role of a prophet. But sometimes we have fallen into this trap of thinking that prophets are only about prediction, they're only about forward future thinking. You know, we think that prophets are somehow kind of like a magician that see things for the future. But the main purpose of a prophet is to deliver God's message for a specific time, that current time that that prophet lives to the people that that prophet knows or lives nearby. Now, the future component comes into play, and often what happens is this, is the prophet, as he delivers the vision that God has given him, he'll say, God will do this, or God will do that, unless you do this and respond this way, living our lives, you know, in a call back to the way God would have us live. So, the short answer for us when we think about prophets is they are God's messengers. <clears throat> and they're delivering his current word to the people of the time. So when we think of prophecy, we need to see that this future component of it, it's, it's an incidental. Yes, there's very much involved as we look at the Old Testament in connection especially with to who Jesus is. But all of those prophecies in the Old Testament had a current word for those people living in that time. So this morning, we're going to take a look at a prophet who is speaking to Israel, specifically the northern tribes of Israel. And his name is Amos. So we're going to take a look at the book of Amos, chapter 7. And I'm going to read from verses 7 on to 17. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people, Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out of here, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because the, this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country. And Israel will surely go into exile away from this native land. As we hear about Amos's vision, he's seen other visions in the previous chapters. But this extra vision, God asks him a question. The Lord says to Amos, what do you see? That's the question that's given. The prophet sees a vision of the Lord standing by a wall and calling his messenger to look. Take a look. What do you see? Take note of this, Amos. You know, we need to take note this morning because there's something that will help us to go deeper 
into God's message for Amos then, and I think his message for us today. Now, I don't want to get too sidetracked by biblical interpretation and biblical interpretation controversy. But I discovered this week in my studies, thinking and reflecting on this passage, that there have been some more recent developments in understanding this book in particular that may help us. So there's been some new, very sound biblical uh, commentaries and scholars that have been at work on them. And for years and years, this passage has been translated where the meaning of the word that is used gets translated into English as plumb line, just as I read. And the word is, in Hebrew, anak. And that has different, different meanings in English. It can mean lead, it can mean plumb line or a plummet, or tin. Probably the Bible that you use, it's like mine, and as I read, it's translated as plumb line. So in that case, the meaning of the God with a plumb line is to see is this wall straight and true. The plumb line holds the weight on the end, and then the string up lets you know in the days before laser levels, long before, back in Amos time, lets the carpenter and the mason know, is this wall true? So God's message in that case is saying, do God's people measure up? They're talking about the covenant and about instructing God's people to do what Israel was called to do, to live in right relationship with God. If you want to live in healthy relationship to Almighty God, then you need to measure up to the law. Now that's a good message to hear and to live out, and that's the way I remember you know, hearing about this as, as I grew up and th- thought about it before and we think about it. But let's consider, however, these newer understanding and interpretation of what that word anak and how that might drive home a different message that's still related for us today. That word anak is a word that's actually borrowed, scholars are saying, from another language. It's not Hebrew, but it's one that's been adopted, if you will, and put in Scripture. And that ties in not only to this moment when Amos is receiving God's vision and instruction and message, but also ties into later where there becomes a play on word and it becomes this uh, idea of groaning. So the scholars basically say that this passage with this word should read something like this. So let me read it to you. This is what the Lord showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall of tin. And tin was in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? Tin, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting tin among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. And then the prophecy continues. Now, in the time that Amos is writing and delivering his message to the people, remember back to the beginning as I talked about prophecy has to deal with God's message, his current word for the people that the prophet is with. Towns and cities, they fortified walls with metal. So they would build, you know, there would be sometimes brick and stone put together, maybe some plaster. And to fortify it even further, aside from just bigger stones, they at times put sheets of metal along the wall. And that metal helped those walls withstand enemy attacks. So the metal that would be used would be things like bronze and copper, sometimes even iron would be suspended. And then the enemy would look to that town and say, whoa, they've got a huge fortress there. Look at those walls. They are lined with metal. There's no way that, you know, the stones that we throw or the the arrows that we fire at those people is going to pierce those walls. So the Lord then asks Amos to look. And the Lord revealed to Amos, Israel thinks they're secure from attack. They think they're mighty. When in fact God is saying their walls are weak. They're not going to be able to withstand the Lord's judgment because of their things like idolatry. So basically God is saying, look what you see. And it's this shiny metal on their walls. And in fact, some scholars say that God 
appears, Yahweh appears standing, holding a piece of tin, implying that he's torn it from the wall, showing how weak it is, telling Amos, that metal that you think is strong, that Israel thinks is mighty, has been ripped to shreds, and your kingdom will be torn. Your might, your confidence, God says, it's ill-placed. And this wall, like your nation, like your way of thinking and living, is going to fall. Now, I know there's correlation between a plumb line, but I find it interesting. Their temple would be ruined and the house of the king would fall by the sword, the prophecy goes on to say, because that tin was not going to do anything more than decorate the walls. It just looks good, shiny. You can take pride in a shiny wall. And for some people, they thought they were mighty for their leaders, the king, the priests. They thought that they had pulled, you know, this greatest trick of the century. Yet they had not remained faithful to live in relationship with Yahweh, the Lord. This was all a show. The king's leadership, the priests, and the leading of the people in their worship of God was all a show. And at the heart of it was weakness. Corruption. And along comes God's prophet Amos. Amos is asked the question, what does he see? And Amos sees idolatry. He sees the corruption and he speaks the Lord's truth in love to warn them. Sometimes we view God as this vengeful God, but God is often telling his people, this will happen. Doesn't, he doesn't often say, boom, that's it, you're done. There's a warning. And so here we see this message. And Amos delivers the message, and the people receive it. And there's great rejoicing at the people knowing the truth. And they make changes to their lives. And they follow after God with all their heart. Now that's how we'd like it to go. But that's not how it is. Because what's happened is the prophet Amos delivers the message. The corrupt priest Amaziah tells the king, you have this person, Amos, who's conspiring against you, O king. And he starts to spread rumors, implying that Amos is somehow trying to kind of rally the people to mutiny. Amos tells, Amaziah tells Amos then, you know, get out of here, you. Go back to Judah. Go back to where you came from and do your prophesying for bread or basically your prophesying for pay. Do that back in Judah. We don't need you here in Israel. Amos speaks up at this moment and he clarifies that this prophet gig is not his day job. You think I'm a prophet? You think I'm all about speaking a message for pay? I don't even come from the school of prophets. Amos tells him, I don't come from a long line of prophets. I'm not a son of a prophet. My dad wasn't a prophet. Nope. I'm a farmer. I'm a rancher. I tend sycamore fig trees. I dress them and I'm a, a herder of animals. And God came to me and gave me this new assignment to go to his people to Israel, because all you religious leaders have stopped seeing the truth. You're blind, Amos says. You think you, you have it all together, and you don't. And as we hear God's message to Amos, God's question, what do you see? I think that's the message we need to take home today. There are some very important lessons from this. Firstly, I think one of the things we need to understand is that we need to hear God's voice. God is speaking to Amos, and we talked about this last week. Do we have the capacity to hear when God is speaking? Do we have the capacity to hear when God is speaking maybe through people we're not expecting? Amaziah and the king are thinking, you know, I'll hear from God this way. And God chooses a prophet He basically commissions someone who wasn't originally schooled in the college of prophets. He wasn't the son of a prophet. God calls him to come and speak truth. Because they weren't listening. Then as we hear 
we need to ask, are we open to the Lord? Or do we go about our lives the day to day ignoring his voice? A voice that calls us to see things the way they are. The Lord asks Amos, what do you see? And then he reveals the truth of what was before him. When I think of my friend the artist, it's not, it's not that the pictures he's taken were hidden from everyone else's view. It's just that he took time to stop and look and see. Everyone else just passed those scenes by. But he had the, the wherewithal to stop, to look, and to see, and then even maybe let the question of what was before him sink into his heart and think, what do I see here? What's unique? As we think of Jesus' life and his ministry to people, you know, often Jesus was asked a question, and he answers that person with a question. And he did that not because Jesus didn't know. It's not that he didn't understand the question. The reason is because he wanted the people to stop, to look inward, maybe outward, and to see. Think of Jesus' situation where a young lawyer comes to him and says to Jesus, what must I do, teacher, to inherit eternal life? How do, how do I be saved? He's asking Jesus. And Jesus answered him with a question. He said, because this young lawyer knew about the Lord and about the law, and so he asked him, what does the law say? And the young lawyer answers rightly. He says, love God with all of who you are, all your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's right. You've answered correctly. You've got the right answer. But the young lawyer, being such as they are, ah, yes, but who is my neighbor is the next question. He was trying to get out of what God is calling him to live, trying to skirt it. What's the closest I can get to the edge without doing everything? Loving God with all of who I am, but what about my neighbor? Do I have to love everyone? And so Jesus tells the story of the traveler who's going to the temple and gets beaten up by robbers. And then who is saved by someone that everyone considered an enemy, an outcast, hated. And it's a parable to teach the young lawyer and the other listeners about seeing people differently. The parable of the Good Samaritan is, is like a question from Jesus that says, when you look around at all the people, what do you see? What's going on in your heart? Because the truth of the matter is often we look around and we look to an appearance, we look to someone and we don't see correctly. We have the wrong idea. Whether it's that we see the shine and the gleam of a wall but because maybe someone is appearing a certain way and we think, oh, that looks so good. Look at that. When if we look with time to really see we would say, wait, wait a minute, there's something amiss there. That's not iron, that's not bronze, that's tin. That's not going to be a defense at all. As I think of the question that Jesus calls his disciples to, he calls us to, is this. He talks about, and again, I know sometimes when we talk about looking around us and really seeing, our minds quickly go to judgment. And Jesus, as we know, calls us not to judge. Don't be a harsh critic. But what Jesus is saying is see for what is really there. So if you see someone that you think is unworthy, don't fall into that trap. Jesus is asking the question, what do you see? What do you see? We need to stop and to recognize that maybe our first step is asking God for a new prescription so we can see clearly. To see things as they are, not as how we think they should be or how we want them to be or how we judge them to be, 
but to see them as they are. And then, as the Lord reveals what is genuinely, really, before our eyes, then we can lovingly bring about change to the situation. When we see injustice, when we see hurt, when we see wrongdoing, that we can then bring about, through Christ in us, transformation. What do you see? Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, as we hear your message to Amos and the people of Israel, it's all too easy for us to sometimes look at the situations around us and get the wrong impression, to think that seems, things seem good when there's wrong there. Forgive us, O oh God. We need your grace and we need to be able to see as you see Jesus, to those around us, to see the truth, to receive the hope that you offer. Help us to see. Open our, the eyes of our heart, O oh Lord. And pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen.
eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. And now receive the benediction, the good word. Now may the one who made the blind man see open our eyes to see all that is around us. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit, strengthen us to bring about change for Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us.